What were you like as a boy? Well, not like any boys my age, I can assure you. I was smarter. I was clever. I could see the world for what it was. I needed out of Glasgow and I knew that there was better waiting for me. What was London like? It was a haven of sex and crime. I had so much sex. Violent sex and violent crime. It's how I operated. How do you think of yourself? A mastermind. A criminal better than the rest. And finally, do you regret any of it? Only that it couldn't have gone on longer. Because you see, I was only just getting started. The best was yet to come. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. How are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. So, thank you for getting in touch about the last episode and about the episode before that. And before we carry on with the story for this week and the shout outs, I'm just going to address something head on. My choice of words in the episode called Linda the Lioness caused some debate. Now, a healthy debate, I would like to think. First off, please know, please know, I choose my descriptions of people very carefully. So, in describing Linda the Lioness... In last week's episode, I called her a ball buster. Now, I think I said at the time that I wasn't comfortable with the term ball buster. I really don't like the phrase. I hate it. Why I used it, I don't know. It's probably just, when I was reading a lot about Linda, it's probably just a way that she was described all the time. Now, I think I might have said this before. I don't listen back to anything that I record. So, see, once I've edited the episode, I put it out, never hear it ever again. So, actually, things that I've said, it's it's people listening that come back to me and remind me of the things that I've said. Now, I'm pretty sure I said I didn't like the term ball buster. I might be wrong. However... Let's do this. Let's put it on the list of things that I won't use or won't say. I would be really happy to do that. It's it's going on a list with a big score put <laughs> right through it. On that list, I'm going to add two other phrases. You'll have heard me talk about these before. I'm going to add the phrase... All American. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. It describes nothing. So it too can get in the bin. It can get in the list. 
And another one. This is the third and final one. Trial of the century. Uh, no, it's not, because everything gets described as the fucking trial of the century, so therefore nothing ever is. Okay? So those three phrases, consider them struck off the list. Okay? They are relegated <laughs> to a place where you won't hear them on this podcast. Is that okay? We cool? Yes? <laughs> Let's not get lost in a feminist debate here around ball buster. I said, unless again I'm dreaming, I don't know, maybe the <laughs> maybe the whole maybe the whole podcast is a dream. I don't know. <laughs> I said I don't like ball buster because I think I think it's really actually anti feminist. I think it's divisive. Anyway, that aside, I hope that's cleared that up. Let's move on to the shout outs and on to this week's story which is bonkers. It's totally nuts. I love looking at this story. How I've not looked at this one before, I do not know. I hope you're really going to love it. Anyway, the shout outs. So, hello to Vanessa York. Vanessa, thank you so much for getting in touch. Darren Betancourt. Now, Darren, I think this is maybe your second shout out. But Darren sent me a really lovely photo, him, his dog Roxy, and uh, is keen that he would like to know, or he thinks that I should like to know, where people listen to the podcast. So, driving, at work, doing your washing, (laughs) washing your dishes, who knows? (laughs) I think there's something nice in that, I think it's a nice idea. Aaron Small, hello Aaron, thanks for getting in touch. And Lorraine Ledwell. Now, Lorraine (laughs) is an avid listener to Extraordinary Stories podcast. She's a really active member in the Facebook group. And this morning, Lorraine had an accident. She fell out of the shower and she bumped her head on the sink and ended up having to go to hospital. But thankfully, Lorraine is okay. So (laughs) we're all sending you... Big love, Lorraine. Hope that you uh, feel better soon. So Vanessa, Darren, Aaron and Lorraine, hello. All right, on with the story. You're not going to believe some of the shit you're going to hear in this. I love it. Are we ready? Okay. Let's go. Okay, so we're starting in my hometown, Glasgow, Scotland. Glesga, as it gets known. <laughs> Glesga. When in 1924, when Archibald Hall is born. He's born about, I'm going to say about 30 minutes away from where I'm sitting right now. Now, as a young boy, Archibald is described as a bit of a loner. Didn't really have any real friends in his life. His home life, I think, was really fragmented. His parents didn't live together. He lived with his mum. But she was working all the time. In a way, I think Archibald was kind of bringing himself up. He often just dodged going to school entirely. And instead, what he would do is he would go and watch music hall shows or variety performances, which he absolutely loved. Like a lot of kind of boys of... That time, that age, he had a newspaper delivery job or a paper round. So, you know, kind of aside from the fact that he was not really going to school, he was just doing his paper round, there weren't really any massive signs of problems with Archibald, really. 
And that was until the age of 15. Now at 15, he started stealing. Quite light theft at first. Nothing too major. He would steal from the collection cans for the Red Cross. Or he would skim money from his paper round. Just the wee, he was just stealing the wee odd thing here and there. Nothing terribly serious. But, like all good thieves, (laughs) if you're starting young, well, you're starting small time, and it's only going to get bigger. If you start it at 15, and you're good at it, and you're getting away with it, then why are you going to stop? You're just going to keep going, aren't you? You're just going to keep going on that path. So Archibald wanted more. So he started to break into local houses in the area. Around about the age 16, 17. And he would steal jewellery. And other belongings. Other things that he could sell. Now, I mean, he was quite brazen. He was quite a bold young man. So he's 17 years old. He's in Glasgow. He's got quite the collection now of stolen jewellery from people's houses. And he thinks, okay, I'm going to go to London and I'm going to sell this jewellery. So, (laughs) off he goes. Off he goes to London with his stolen jewellery in a suitcase. And when he gets there, he's actually quite successful in selling it on. So he's making some quite nice, quite nice money. He does this a few times. Goes back to Glasgow, steals a few more necklaces, earrings, rings, whatever he can kind of get his hands on. Goes down to London, sells it on. But there's one particular visit to London in which... He runs into police. Police immediately are suspicious because they're like, why is this 17-year-old got all of this quite expensive jewellery and he is arrested for theft? And so he's sent to prison for a really short spell of time. It's not for too long. I think the courts at the time were like, well, yeah, it's a serious business that he's, you know, stolen some jewellery, but it's his first offence. He's only 17, and so a short spell in prison, that'll do. Now, at the time, and this is going to be a massive indicator of what Archibald will end up doing with his life, at the time, when a young 17-year-old went to prison. Maybe it's not too different from today, actually. They were given the choice of something to learn or study while in prison. It does still happen today, you know. You can be sent to prison and you can learn a skill. You can learn a trade. You can study a subject. You can get qualifications. So, you know can be anything. Something practical, woodwork, joinery, how to be a mechanic. Or you could study a science. You could study English, maths, whatever. Okay? So Archibald is given the choice of what does he want to study in prison? And does he pick something practical like cars, woodwork, Joinery? Well, no. He picks... (laughs) Get this. (laughs) He picks to study antiques. Yeah. Antiques. And he reads for hours about the history of antiques. 
he spent his time in prison reading books about the history of the Scottish aristocracy, how antiques had come into their life, come into their family. He learned whole family histories of the rich people in Scotland. He learned where all of the aristocracy lived through books. Now, this is just right. <laughs> I think this is insane. In prison, as well as learning about antiques, he also gets elocution lessons <laughs> to, and I quote, <laughs> soften his harsh Scottish accent. <laughs> Maybe I need elocution lessons. Maybe that would help me. Nah, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> maybe me going, Hello, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. <laughs> what was that? I don't know why. Well, for a start, I don't know why I'd turn into uh, Queen Elizabeth. That would be ridiculous. But um, yeah, Archie Bold, he felt, he felt he definitely needed elocution lessons because he didn't like his harsh Scottish accent. So, here he is, he gets out of prison. And he is equipped now with knowledge. And you know what they say, knowledge is power. And, in his case, it really, really is. He goes from prison and he travels to London, to Soho to be exact. Soho is now like a very, very trendy place to live in London. You'd uh, need to be a millionaire these days <laughs> to afford anywhere to live <laughs> in Soho. But back in the 1940s, it was a bit of an area of crime. It was known for lots of gangs, lots of criminal activity. Some of the best actual UK known gangs were operating in Soho at that time. And Archibald, he wanted to be a part of this. Now, there are a couple of things I need to tell you about Archibald because they will become very important to his story. Three things. Number one. He had changed his name to Roy Fontaine. He was no longer Archibald. He was now Roy Fontaine. He'd chosen Fontaine after the actress, Joan Fontaine. Archibald, or Roy, as we'll know him from here on in, was bisexual and he was open about his love of men and women and sex. And third, he was using what he had learned in prison about antiques to pass himself off as an educated antique jewellery expert. So, here he is. He's in London, in Soho, where it's all going on. It's a really heady, crazy mix of crime, sex, alcohol, gambling. And Roy uses his elocution training that he received in prison to present himself as a well-educated Scottish socialite. You know, someone from a wealthy background. He speaks with a really posh accent now and he dresses in a way that makes people think and really believe that Roy Fontaine is an educated, wealthy Scottish man. 
know the truth at all. He was a working class Glaswegian, but here he is pretending otherwise. So Roy, in his own head, well, also in his own words, he thinks he's a master criminal. You know, he thinks of himself as a great confidence trickster. Here he is using a fake voice, fancy clothing. You know, he's mixing with the wealthy and he's he's still at the old jewel theft business. He's still worming his way into people's confidences and then stealing their jewellery. He organised raids on jewellery stores across London and he attempts to pull off massive heists and steal thousands of pounds worth of jewellery. I mean, he honestly thinks he is the dog's bollocks of crime. He's also boasting, right? Oh, He's boasting that he's pumping all these men and women all over the... Sorry. I just realised I said that like I was in the pub with my friend. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said pumping. It's terrible. I shouldn't have said the word pumping. He's, yeah, basically he's boasting that he's having sex with, <laughs> with men and women all over the place. So he thinks, you know, he thinks he's amazing at this point. He's really got this idea of himself that he is this big man in town. So, does all of this prove to be true? That Roy Fontaine is a master criminal. The best that Britain has ever seen. Well, no. Not really. Because police very quickly catch up to what Roy Fontaine is all about. And between the years of 1945 and 1977, he spends most of that in prison for theft. I mean, it's all well and good to think you're the big man of crime, but clearly he wasn't very good at not getting caught. In total, that's 22 years in and out of prison. Calm yourself down, mate. You're not... You're not the criminal that you think you are if you're spending 22 years in and out of prison. Stop running about acting like you think you're the fucking actual big boss in town, because you're not. Oh. So by 1977, he's out of prison for the third time in his life. He's now 53. And while you might think, perhaps, okay, maybe perhaps Roy has had his time as a criminal. Oh no. Roy Fontaine is just getting started. What Roy is about to do next is just insane. Roy is about to take another role in life. So, he's been the working class Glaswegian. He's been the posh Scottish antiques expert. And his next role is that of a butler. Yes, a butler. So what he does is he makes up these like fictional jobs that he's held as a butler to the rich families of Scotland. It's all bollocks. It's all nonsense. So using these fake references, which he's just made up himself, Roy takes a job working for a widow called Margaret Hudson. Margaret's husband had been a politician in Scotland and when he had died, Margaret had been left with a really large property 
in a really expensive area of Scotland. But she needed a butler to help her out. Enter Roy Fontaine. Now, Margaret takes him on. But little does she know, Roy has a plan. His plan is to gain Margaret's confidence and then steal from her. So he thinks, right, well, Margaret's old. She's really old. And, you know, she trusts me. This will be a piece of cake to steal from her. But then something in Roy changes. Now, (laughs) hang on. Don't go thinking for a second he's suddenly the good guy. As the story unfolds, you'll realise he isn't. But something in him, when he's working for Margaret, it does actually change and he decides that actually he quite likes working for her and actually he quite likes her. So he changes his mind and he thinks, actually, I'm not going to steal from her. I'm not going to take her jewels and rob her of her money. I'm just going to ride out my job here as a butler for a while while I figure out my next plan. But Margaret is not going to be a victim of that theft. Like I said, don't go thinking he's a fucking hero just because he, you know, had that change of heart about her. There's someone else who's about to join the story and cause Roy some massive headaches. A man called David Wright gets a job as a gamekeeper for Margaret in the place that Roy is working, in that same house. And when David Wright starts on his first day, who does he meet? Roy Fontaine. The two men look at each other and instantly they know each other. How? Well, during one of Roy's prison stints, he'd shared a cell with David Wright, the new gamekeeper. Okay. So, shit. Roy's thinking, I'm totally loving my life here, pretending to be a butler, and this guy is going to ruin it for me. He's going to give the game away. He's going to let Margaret or other people know that actually I'm a criminal. So the two of them, they talk, and Roy says, look, please don't expose me. I like this old lady. I like this job. Don't ruin it for me. David Wright says, no. I want to steal from her. Roy says, no, look, go get another job on another estate, in another house, steal from someone else. Just not here, just not where I am. But David Wright is determined. He's going to steal from Margaret. And he threatens Roy. He says to him, if you don't help me, I'll expose who you really are. I'll go straight to Margaret. And I'll tell her that her beloved butler is in fact a criminal. Now Roy, he can't risk this. So, here's what he does. He says to David, look, we can work this out. Tomorrow, you and I, let's go on a long walk. We'll go rabbit hunting. And we'll chat this thing through. So David agrees. And the following day, they go on their long walk, each with a rifle. And when they're far enough away from the house, into the grounds of the really vast estate, Roy Fontaine shoots David Wright in the skull with his rifle. (laughs) 
And when he's satisfied that David's dead, he buries his body in a shallow grave on the grounds of the estate. He then returns to his job that day with Margaret as if nothing had happened. Where is the where is the groundskeeper? Margaret asks. Uh, well, I've got no idea, says Roy, having buried him only hours before. Roy only lasts another few weeks working for Margaret, working as the butler. She starts to get suspicious of Roy. I mean, she might be old, but she's no daft. And she asks about, who knows this guy? In fact, has anyone ever really employed him before? Where did he come from? She can't really get satisfactory answers, so she lets Roy go. She has a bad feeling about Roy. And Margaret, she was right to have a bad feeling. Because... If you think that murdering his ex-prison cellmate and burying him was bad, for Roy Fontaine, that was just the tip of the iceberg. So very much enjoying his butler role, he takes another job with an elderly couple who are retired politicians. That's obviously where all the money was at the time. Yeah, because he keeps taking up butlering duties with people who are either retired politicians or spouses of politicians. This time, it's with Walter Elliot and his wife Dorothy, a very wealthy couple. Now, Walter was in his 80s and Dorothy in her 60s. And they lived in a huge house in Knightsbridge in London. Ooh, fancy pants. <laughs> Fuck. Now I said earlier on that Soho was posh. Oh my God, Knightsbridge. If you don't know London, Knightsbridge, fancy as fuck. Still is now. Oh my God, it's so posh. So ridiculously expensive. So, this is where he's now going to be the new butler to Walter and Dorothy. Right, so now just before he takes this job, he goes for a wee trip into London and he bumps into a guy that he hasn't seen in years. A man called Michael Kitto. Now, we're just going to call him Keto from here on in. It's just easier, okay? So, he bumps into Keto in a pub. Right, so who is Keto? And why should we care about him in this story? Well, Keto was a man who was constantly in and out of trouble with the police. In and out of prison for theft. And Roy and Kitto, they had crossed paths previously in prison. Now, Kitto and Roy, they shared another commonality between them. They had a deep attraction to each other. The two of them began a sexy relationship. And Roy started to form a plan. He's thinking, I've started a relationship with this guy Kitto I've got this new job being a butler in this big fuck off expensive house in Knightsbridge I know I'm going to combine all those things I'm going to get Kitto to work with me here and together we can steal from this house remember I told you earlier Roy Fontaine, he really thinks he is a criminal mastermind. At this point, he's thinking, 
We're going to be a dream team. I'm going to pose as the butler. And together, me and Kitto, we are going to go around all these houses and we're going to steal from the rich. So over a drink in a pub in London, Roy says to Kitto, I have a plan and it's this. I'm going to go to my job working for Walter and Dorothy in their big fancy house and we're going to steal from them. Now, Roy uh, decides to not really stop there because obviously, you know, he's a a mastermind. (laughs) He decides he wants to involve someone else. You know, just because sometimes, I I get that, sometimes when you're committing crimes, you just need another person (laughs) to help you out. (laughs) Who is this person? Well... Her name is Mary Coggle. Now, Mary was an old friend of Kitto. And Roy, he gets the three of them together and he talks them all into the plan. He says, right, I'm going to go in as the butler. You're going to get a job as a maid. And Kitto will get you some kind of job within the house, within the estate, whatever. Right, we'll get the three of us will get a job. Easy, he says. Fucking easy. The three of us will work together and we'll share the riches once we've stolen from these people. So the couple that they are planning this attack on are a very wealthy couple. Walter and Dorothy, they have houses all over Britain. They've got bank accounts around the world. And in their home, they have plenty of priceless antiques to steal. They've got jewellery. They've got clothing. They've got so much money. So... Roy tells the other two, this is going to be so easy. Roy, Kitto and Mary, here they are, the three of them. The new Charlie's Angels. No, hang on. (laughs) No, hang on. Charlie's Angels, I think. No, they were crime fighting. (laughs) The new... Oh, hang on. I, I can't think of a crime trio. Oh, wait there, am I being really stupid? Is there a really obvious crime trio that I can't think of? No? Well, if there is, <laughs> answers on a postcard, because I can't think of a crime trio. Okay. Now, there's a small flaw in the plan. There's no job for Kitto. Yeah, sadly, Roy is the butler. Mary, she gets her position as the maid, but there's no job for Kitto. So, they have to use their positions to try and hide him in the house. I mean, it's not hard, I would think, given it's a massive house with 85 bedrooms, 17 kitchens. Well, (laughs) I'm exaggerating, but it is huge. So for Roy and Mary to hide Kitto, their accomplice. It's not terribly difficult. They go through this kind of elaborate thing of hiding Kitto as they work out their plan of how to start stealing bit by bit from Walter and from Dorothy. Roy keeps telling them, this will be us set for life. We can do whatever we want after this. Because once he's stolen these antiques, Once he's stolen this jewellery, this money, we're set for life. On a side note, if you are wondering how he gets these positions, well, he just fakes really good references. And they're just such good fakes that he gets away with it. I mean, is it as good as the fake notes that I used to take to school (laughs) <laughs> to get me out of playing sports. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I'm not sure. 
<laughs> I used to take letters written <laughs> by my mum all the time. And for some reason, the school used to always believe them. I don't know. Maybe I was just good at writing fake letters at <laughs> 14 and 15. <laughs> I just, it's not that I don't really like doing sports at all. Um, I actually do. I really, really, really enjoy exercise. But my school was just one of these ones that was just like so sports focused. You had to be brilliant at every sport. And quite often, I'd rather spend my time in an art class or in the art department or whatever, rather than, you know, constantly playing rugby or constantly playing football. I wasn't really into that. I mean, don't get me wrong. (laughs) I wasn't, (laughs) I wasn't against the showers after a, (laughs) a sports class. But yeah, just all the time, constant sports classes. I used to write all these little fake letters to get me out of it. Oh, Barry has a sore knee today. He can't do this. Um, so, but I'm sure I'm sure Roy's letters were something pretty, pretty bloody good to worm his way into these jobs. So in the house, this is what was happening. Roy was hiding Kittle in rooms and in places that he wouldn't be discovered. And at night, he would bring Kittle into his bedroom. They'd go to bed, sleep together, and in the morning, Kittle would need to get up and go back into hiding somewhere in the house. And all the while, Mary was keeping up her role as the maid. I mean, it's sounding like the plot for some stupid farcical comedy but it's about to take a turn towards the dark very quickly on a Tuesday morning months after Roy had been employed. Him and Kittle are in one of the rooms upstairs in the house looking at some antique objects and discussing how they'll get them out of the house when Dorothy, the lady of the house, walks into the room. She is immediately startled. For a start, the butler should not be in this room. And secondly, she doesn't recognise the other man, Kittle. Why are these men even here? And what are they doing looking at her antique collection? Both men panic, and in the moment, They realise the game could be over and there is only one way to solve this. Roy and Kitto grab Dorothy and they force her to the floor. Roy takes a pillow and while Kitto holds her down he places the pillow over Dorothy's face until she's dead. Oh God. Okay, so now this has escalated. They have a dead Dorothy on their hands. They've just murdered the lady of the house and they're thinking, fuck, 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 what do we do? How do we deal with this? It's not going to be long until someone notices she's gone. Her husband is going to be looking for her. So what the hell are they going to do? Well, now it's just going to get even more crazy. They leave Dorothy's body in the room where they've just killed her. They go downstairs to where her husband is and they give him a drink. The drink is laced with lots of sleeping pills and he falls asleep. So this buys them a bit of time. They've killed Dorothy, they've drugged Walter, and now the three of them, they need 
to come up with a plan. Now Mary, acting as the maid, well, she didn't participate in the killing, but they're going to need to use Mary a lot here if they want to get away with this. So the next day, Walter wakes up from his drugged sleep. And of course, he wants to know where his wife is. And the three of them say, Ah, well, she's just upstairs. She is preparing for a trip to Scotland. And we are going to drive you there. Okay? Odds? Bizarre? Walter must be thinking, Okay. Fine. But remember that they've drugged him, so he's completely disorientated. They say to Mary, here's what you need to do. You need to dress up in Dorothy's clothes. A fur coat, one of her dresses, a hat, some glasses. And he is so drugged. Walter is so drugged out of his face, he won't know you're not really his wife. You just need to pretend to be Dorothy for a few days. What? What the fucking what? What are you talking about? Creepy. Mary dressing up as the dead Dorothy. Ah. But also, what they do is they put Walter, drugged out his face, in the back of the car with Mary dressed Oh, as Dorothy. And they go on this drive to Scotland for three days. These two guys are improvising like fuck at this moment. They're just making it up as they go along. I cannot get the bizarre image out of my mind of Roy Fontaine driving the car Kitto sitting in the front seat, Walter drugged up to the eyeballs in the back seat with Mary dressed up as his wife, Dorothy, sitting next to him. It's insanity. It's just absolute insanity. (sighs) The truth is, Dorothy's dead body was in the trunk of the car. That's what's even creepier. They're going on this drive and her body is in the boot of the car. I mean, that is a what the actual fuck moment, if ever I've heard it. True crime stories blow my mind and people will do bizarre things. And, well, you'll know this, the bizarre, the weirder, the crazier, the more I love it. I just, this car journey to me is it's just insane for three days they drive they stop at country hotels they stay overnight Walter and Mary obviously in separate rooms Kitto and Roy sharing a bed so they carry on to Scotland and once they reach a stretch of country where there's no one around four miles they stop the car Roy now has a new part of the plan. I say the plan, he's literally making it up as he goes along. <sighs> Roy, Mary, and Kitto, they get the 82 year old Walter out of the back of the car. Roy takes a shovel from the back of the car where Dorothy's body is, and while the other two hold him, Roy beats him to death with the shovel. Oh my God. That poor man. His last few moments, his last few days, must have just been so disorientating. Can you imagine? Once they are satisfied that he's dead, they bury him in a place where they don't think that he will be found. As they walk away from Walter's body, they hear a groaning. 
he's not dead. So this is what Roy does. He returns to Walter's body and he stands on Walter's throat, crushing his windpipe until Walter is dead. The three of them drive on and later they stop to dispose of Dorothy's body. Again, they bury it remotely, thinking no one will find it. These three are the fucking worst. They really are. Oh, what did these three bastards do next? Well, this. They went back to the original plan. To steal all that they could from Walter and Dorothy's house. They still wanted to make their fortune out of antiques. So, with Walter and Dorothy buried somewhere in Scotland, they returned to London and they ransacked the house. They took everything they could. Money, jewellery, heirlooms, clothing, anything imaginable, they took it. With the money that they made from that, Kitto and Roy set themselves up in a wee shag pad in London and Mary got herself a flat. Now, Mary was becoming something of a problem to Roy and Kitto. Why? Well, the thing is, <laughs> Mary seemed to quite enjoy her time pretending to be the rich Dorothy and she was causing quite a lot of fuss because she'd stolen a lot of Dorothy's clothes from the house and she was walking about wearing fur coats, expensive jewellery and going to lots of posh places demanding she be treated like a lady. And people who were in that society were like, who in the hell is this crazy? Where does she come from? She just arrived out of nowhere. And she's acting like Lady of the Manor. So people are like, what is going on here? Who is she? I mean, the whole story is hideous. But I do love the idea of Mary running around London being like, look at me, I'm a lady, waiter, champagne, oysters please. So Roy and Kittle, well, it made them nervous. They were like, ah no, we don't like this, she is going to blow this for us. So, of course, Roy has a plan. It's a simple plan. Mary has to go. One night they invite Mary to their home. And having already killed Dorothy and Walter... They add Mary to their list of victims. They attack Mary with a fire poker, striking her across the head until she's dead. They put Mary's body in the back of their car. They drive to a nearby river and they throw her body off of the bridge into the water. What a pair of fuckers they got her involved that's what kind of drives me a little bit insane I know she wasn't blameless right I know she wasn't blameless I know that she was there when Walter was beaten to death and buried but she was also just a part of Roy's plan I just think by this point Roy and Kitto they just lost it I mean I can see that they didn't intentionally want to kill Dorothy. Murder was never really their plan. I don't think that they set out to do it. It's unfortunate that Dorothy walked in and saw the two of them looking at antiques and then that kind of escalated and then they were just improvising all the time and they couldn't risk being caught. But 
I get that it was like, oh shit, we've created a situation, let's improvise. But with Mary, it just feels like really deliberate. It's like, oh, she's going to ruin it for us. She has to go. We've killed a few by now. Let's just add her to the list. So are Roy and Kitto done? Is that it? Well, no. These two lovers have one more murder in them. Kitto and Roy, having gotten away with the crimes that they've committed, are living in London and they have plenty of money from the thefts. They've now got a series of bodies buried around the UK, but they've gotten away with it. Now, Kitto had a half-brother named Donald, who was currently serving a prison sentence for robbery, and he was about to be released from prison. So here's Roy and Kitto, they are shacked up, hoping never to be caught. (laughs) When Kitto hears that his half-brother Donald is getting released, this is a man that Roy had never ever met. Now Kitto has a real issue with his half-brother Donald. Why? He's convinced his half-brother is a paedophile. He's absolutely sure of it. He's convinced. He talks to Roy about this and he says, I'm just convinced he likes to touch children. And I want something done about it when he gets out of prison. And so, who has been the puppet master this whole entire time? Who has been the person that's led this narrative, led this situation. Roy Fontaine. And here's Roy about to come up with another plan. I mean, why not? Do you know what I mean? It's gone well for Roy so far. (laughs) Whenever he's come up with a plan, do you know what I mean? They've all gone, they've all gone really well. So why not? Why not trust him to come up with something else for fuck's sake? When Donald gets out of prison, the couple invite him to stay at their house. And this is what they do. They wait for Donald to go for a bath. And when he's naked and just about to climb into the bath, they burst into the bathroom. They push a rag with chloroform on it into his face. And when he's unconscious, they drown him in the bath water. They then put his body in the boot of their car and they drive from London to Scotland. Always obsessed with returning to Scotland, these pair. I mean, I'm guessing that's Roy's thing. I'm guessing that's Roy's obsession. Anyway, here's where it's about to go very, very wrong for Roy and for Kitto, and their murderous ways are about to come to an end. They stop at a hotel in Scotland, in Berwick, and they leave Donald's body in the boot of their car while they go inside to check in. Now the hotel owner, (laughs) I watched this hotel owner in a couple of interviews, and he, he makes me really laugh. He was immediately suspicious of the two of them. So the two of them came to him and they said, can we get a room for the night? And he said, okay, two single rooms. And they said, no, no, we want one room between us. So what I love about this hotel owner is he didn't give a fuck that they were two men wanting to share a single room. He was looking at them thinking, you two look a bit shifty. You look a bit dodgy. I think you're going to try and get out of this hotel in the morning and not pay me my money. I just love that. 
1978 Scottish man who's like, I don't really care if the two of you want to share a bed. I want my money. That's, that's all that he was thinking about. But he definitely had... A, he was picking up something really strange from Roy and from Kitto. They were giving him a weird vibe. So once the two of them are in their room, the hotel owner calls the police and he says, Look, I've got two guys in my hotel. I'm just getting a really bad feeling. There's something dodgy about them. They're a bit suspicious. Can you come down and just mm, have a wee look around? Check something out. And police say, well, okay. There's not much to go on apart from a feeling you've got, but okay. So they come to the hotel. And while Roy and Kitto are upstairs in bed, police look at their car. They search it. They open the back of the car and they find the dead body of Donald. So police go into the hotel and they ask for both men to come downstairs to talk to them. Roy immediately makes a run for it. (laughs) What a great partner in crime. (laughs) He... (laughs) He jumps out of a bathroom window and he flees, but he only gets like half a mile down the road and police bring him back. That night, they are both arrested for the body in the car and taken to a police station. Now Roy, the great mastermind, The wonderful criminal breaks down in a police interview and he tells the whole story. He confesses to the killings of David Wright, Dorothy, Walter, Mary and Donald. Kitto confesses his part in the crimes also. In 1978, Roy Fontaine, or Archibald Hall, that wee boy from Glasgow that we started the story with, was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Kitto was sentenced to 15 years for his part in the crimes. I feel like that's quite a short sentence for Kitto. But, okay, that's what it was. So, Archibald Hall stroke Roy Fontaine will forever go down in history as one of Scotland's worst serial killers. And so ends the story. So much of what I've read was a lot of like, just a lot of people going, why is this story not more known? Why is this not a serial killer that we know more about? Or like, I don't know, maybe some of you've heard of Archibald Hall stroke Roy Fontaine. Maybe you know this story, but yeah, I really wasn't aware of it. I, you know, you think of all those big hitters, you think, yeah, you know, you, you think of all the the bigger serial killers that we all know, but this story is bonkers. It's absolutely bananas. I'm just shocked that it's taken me a year of podcasting to actually find this story. And when I found it, I was like, um, okay, have to do this story now. Like, I can't even, I can't even wait. I can't even put it on a list of things that I might want to do in the future. I have to tell it now. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed that little tale. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to wind this up by saying if you want to get in touch, you can. I'm on all the social medias. 
join the Facebook group. It's a really fantastic place to be. Also, I've not said this one for a while, but if you do have five seconds and you listen through iTunes, please could you leave me a review? Reviews really help to kind of like bump you up iTunes and it just gets more people listening to the podcast. I'm on Patreon. Should you want to support the podcast in any way, that would be lovely. Otherwise, yeah. Thanks for listening. It's always good to know that people are listening and that I'm not just a madman (laughs) in a room (laughs) telling stories. So, until the next short stories episode, okay, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs>